Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, so today I'm going to talk about dependency injection. Dependency injection is a design pattern. Uh, it's a very, very simple concept to understand, um, but it's very hard to explain, probably because you need to use it a lot to really understand the benefits of using dependency injection. So the first part of the talk is going to be about dependency injection, the design pattern, so that everyone really understands what's what is it about? And the second part of the talk is more about the dependency injection container that you get when you are using Symfony or when you will be using Drupal 8. Um, so first, when I'm talking about the container, uh, that's something I'm, I'm going to introduce later on in the session. Uh, but the very first part is really about just what is dependency injection. Um, the first thing is that dependency injection is a design pattern that you can use when you are doing object-oriented programming. So you can't use dependency injection if you are just using uh, functions. So you need some classes. So um, to make things clear, hopefully, I'm going to talk about this user class. Um, when you are managing a web application, you need a user at some point. So user is something that you can um, implement to store some user preferences, like its language, for instance. And because the HTTP protocol is stateless, you need to also have a way to store those preferences, so here the language of the user, from one request to the next one. So we need two different objects. One, to be able to represent um, the user preferences, this is this class, and the other one, which would be uh, um, uh, a way to store all the preferences from one request to the next one. So using this user class is pretty easy. You create a user and you set a language, for instance. Right? So to be able to store uh, this information into, uh, between HTTP requests, we can use PHP sessions. So here, here is the, the, the session storage. So this is a class that you can use to actually store things in the session, a very simple one. Uh, it takes one argument for uh, the constructor, uh, the cookie name uh, with a default value. Uh, it starts the session when you create a session storage object and then you can set things on uh, the storage. And of course, there is probably uh, a get method to be able to get back things from the storage. So now, I have this problem. I have two different objects two different responsibilities. One is about managing the user preferences and the other one is about storing things into um, a session. Totally different, but the user needs a session storage to be able to work properly when used uh, in a web application. So here is how I can use both objects into one um, convenient package. So. Here in the constructor of the user class, I create a session storage. Right? And whenever I set the language, instead of storing it locally into uh, the user, uh, user property, I set it uh, in, the, in the storage. From the user perspective, this is exactly the same as before. If you want to use the user, you create a new user, you set the language. Everything happens behind the scenes. So you are not aware that this user object is actually using a session storage. Right. Okay, so it's very easy to use, but it's very hard to customize. So another way would be to actually inject the dependency into the user object. So instead of creating the storage object in the user constructor, here you can see that the storage is injected into uh, the constructor. Now, if you have a look uh, at the code, it's very easy to customize because I can inject any kind of storage. I don't care about which one you are going to inject, but it's slightly more difficult to use. Now, if I want to create a user, I need to understand that first I need to create a session storage and then I need to inject the session storage into the user object before being able to set the language or get the language, whatever. Right. So from a design perspective, it's much better to use this solution, but from a user perspective, the developer 
who is going to use your user object, it's slightly more difficult to use because now you need to be uh, aware of all the dependencies that you need to be able to create a user object. This slide is dependency injection. So that's dependency injection, nothing more. Very easy to understand, very easy to actually use if you want. The biggest problem being that it's a bit more difficult to use and that's the biggest problem and that's why at some point people don't really use dependency injection because it makes things harder for the end user. So again, the difference between the two different slides, the two different user classes is subtle but very important. In one case, I create the, 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 the storage object within the constructor when using the dependency injection pattern, I inject it into the, the, the constructor instead. So, this is a design pattern, this is a good practice, um, but just understanding that this is a good practice is not enough. Why? Why is it really something that is useful and why it's, it is much better to actually use dependency injection? So, I want to, um, show you why this is really important and, and so that we can see the benefits. Um, so the first thing I want to do, so I, I'm going to take the first example, trying to figure out how I can customize um, the session storage without using dependency injection. So the first thing I want to be able to do is to change the session cookie name. Remember, uh, the session storage class takes a session name, so this is the cookie name really, as a first argument. So here, instead of using the default one, I want to uh, name it session, right? So this is one way to do that. Can you see a problem here? Why this is not a very good idea? Yeah? Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, it's very hard um, to customize that from the outside of the user class. Right? So if I want to be able to configure the session name from the outside, so creating a configuration file or storing the name in, in a variable outside of the user object, that's not possible. So everything is hardcoded. So the way you can configure the session storage is hardcoded into the user class. That's not really um, flexible enough. So one way to fix that would be to create a constant, right? So a bit different from a variable, but that works. So now I can say, okay, there is this constant and this is the session name. And now I can change the session name if I want from the outside of the user class. Um, that's one way to do that, but this is a global constant. So if I want to be able to test my user class with different storage strategies, with different cookie names, I can't. Well, this is a constant, so you can change the, um, the value anymore. So instead of doing that, uh, you can inject the session name into the constructor of the user class. Right? So here, I pass the session string as an argument uh, to the constructor uh, class. Um, that works. But what if I need to pass more variables? What if I have more things to configure on the session storage object? It's going to add more arguments to uh, the constructor. And what if the user class itself has some arguments? I'm going to be able, I, I'm going to mix and match the arguments for the user class and the ones from, uh, for uh, the session storage class. So it's possible, but it's not optimal. Um, okay, so instead of passing all the arguments one after the other, you can also create an array. So here I've created an array and this array is about all the options that you can pass to the session storage. It's a bit better because there is only one argument used uh, to pass the, the session storage um, um, constructor arguments, but still, it's not good enough, right? Um, the user class should not be aware of how you want to configure the station storage, right? I want the objects to be decoupled I don't want a user class to know anything about the session storage. Okay, and for to, to be able to fix all those problems, you can just use dependency injection. 
So the right way is to create the object first, the session storage object first. You configure it in any way. It's really up to you, and then you inject it into the user class. So it solves all the problems, except that it's a bit more complex to use. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So now I want to talk about some other solutions that work, kinda, but are less interesting than dependency injection. So instead of using dependency injection, you can create a um, registry class. So you have this global object where you store all the dependencies, right? So you create your session storage, you set it into the registry, and then from the user constructor, you get it from the registries, which means that from the user uh, perspective, you can just create the user and use it as before. You don't need to be aware that the user is actually depending on the session storage. Um, it's bad for many reasons, but the main one is you are adding yet another layer for nothing. Just using dependency injection is much better. So it doesn't solve anything. This is the, not the right solution. It's more complex for no added benefit. Um, so using dependency injection is much better in this case. So dependency injection is it's something that is really easy to understand. It solves many problems. Um, and, and yeah, there, there is no need to uh, actually reinvent the wheel. And, and the register pattern is, is not one way to solve this specific problem. OK, so if you are using dependency injection, everything becomes natural, very easy. If I want to change the session storage, let's say I want to store uh, my session in memcached, for instance. I can just swap the dependency, create a memcached session storage, and then inject it into the user. The user doesn't care about um, which kind of session storage you are actually injecting. injecting. Um, for testing, you can create an array uh, session storage, probably a mock, uh, very easy to do. Of course, the next stage would be to create an interface. Uh, so instead of you know, injecting any kind of object, you create a session storage interface. Um, there is a simple one with a get method, a set method. So this is a contract between the user class and the session storage. Right? So now, uh, if I have a look at the constructor of the user class, you can see that I've added the session storage interface int. So this is the contract. So it means that now you can inject any class implementing this interface. So any class with a get method and a set method will work. Right. Okay. Um, and of course, um, the big benefit of using interfaces means that if you are using PHP unit, for instance, you can get a mock. So instead of creating uh, a mock yourself, you can ask PHP unit to create one for you. So if you don't want to actually create a session, and if you want to unit test this user class, you don't have any session. You don't have any HTTP request. So you can ask PHP unit to create a mock for you, and then you can easily test your uh, user class without any dependency on a session storage, a real one. So it helps um, building clean code, really. Uh, your code is going to be reusable. Right, so the, um, um, <coughs> the session storage is reusable without the user class, and the user class is reusable without using uh, the same, always the same uh, session storage. Uh, testable, because you can rely on interfaces. Pluggable, so you can change the dependency with whatever you want. And loosely coupled, I have one user object. Its single responsibility is to actually manage the user preferences, and then there is the session storage its only responsibility is to manage uh, the storage of things. Really. So it's all about the separation of concerns. Um, this is a definition of dependency injection. It comes from a Java library, actually. So dependency injection is where components, a component being um, an object, really, uh, are given their dependency through their constructor. That's what I've shown you. But also methods are directly into fields properties. So there, 
there is three different ways to actually inject dependencies into uh, your object. The first one is the constructor injection. This is probably um, the most useful injection, but you can also use some setters or drop into uh, properties. I don't like the last one, uh, so that's probably not really a good practice in PHP. Um, I really like the constructor argument um, um, injection because your objects are usable right away. So when you create the, a new user object, you know that you need to inject a storage, so you can use the user object right away. If you are using setter injection, you need to remember to actually call the setter uh, before being able to use um, the object. So the setter injection is interesting for optional um, dependencies. So if, for instance, you want to log uh, when a user changes his uh, preferences, for instance, you can inject a logger. But as you don't want to log in the production environment, for instance, you can use a setter injection. So if there is one logger injected, you are using it. If not, you are just doing nothing. Setter injection is also um, better when you have a very long list of dependencies for one object instead of having you know, tens of uh, arguments for uh, the constructor. But then again, uh, it probably means that your object is doing too much, so it's probably um, a good sign that you need to actually decouple your, your code a bit more. It's also um, the only way to actually break circular references. So if object A depends on object B and B depends on A, you can use, uh, you cannot use a constructor injection, so you can use setter injection. But that's very, uh, that's a very edge case. So most of the time, uh, using constructor injection is, is the way to go. Okay. Um, so this is dependency injection. Um, so if you have any question at this point, if something is not clear, please, please ask any questions now. Uh, it's going to be a bit more complex in a minute, so. It's clear for everyone? Yes? That's a yes or that's a no? That's a yes, thank you. Okay, so, um, as you might know, uh, I'm the creator of Symfony, so I like to create frameworks. So let's create a, a small framework, a very small one. So when talking about the web, you have a request, you have a response, you have some kind of user, you have a session storage, you have some cache, you have some routing. So you have a bunch of objects, classes, and here is how I can create uh, my small framework. So I create the request object, I create the response object, the user, the cache, the routing, and then I'm, I'm using them. So to be able to bootstrap a page, I need to create those one, two, three, four, five, six different objects. Uh, and as you can see, I've used dependency injection here. Yes? Yes. Um, so that's fine. It works. But I don't want to force my users, so, so developers using my framework to actually copy and paste this piece of code on every single page. So I need to abstract that into something that is easier to use. So what, I, what I've done is that I've abstracted that, I've moved everything into an application class. Right? So now it's much easier to bootstrap the process, um, just create an application, and then in the constructor, Everything is actually created, right? So it's much easier for the developer using my framework to actually bootstrap the page instead of knowing all the, the details about uh, all the object that needs to be created. I've done everything for them into this um, application class. Can you spot the problem here? Hmm? Yeah. So basically we are back to square one. If you have a look at the class, we are not using dependency injection anymore, right? Because the creation of all those objects are done into the constructor of my application class. So if I want to tweak, um, uh, to tweak the uh, configuration of my framework, it's not possible anymore. If I want to change the session ID, if I want to change the, the path for, for the cache, it's not possible anymore. Right? This is the exact problem solved by dependency injection. That here, I'm stuck. I cannot fix that. Because the first version, it, wa it was not that easy for users to actually use my code, but it was very flexible. Now, 
by using this application class, it's much, it's, it is much easier to use my code, but it's not flexible anymore. In this case, we need what we call a container. So a container, a service, um, um, a dependency injection container, is an object that knows how to create your objects, how to configure them. Um, it knows about the dependencies of all your objects, and it knows how to create and configure them when you need them. So basically, a container is an object able to um, create uh, the graph or of your objects that you need in a given application. So let's have a look at uh, the previous example. So I have this user class. It depends on a session storage interface. One implementation is the session storage, for instance. And I want to be able to change the session storage class name and also the session name. So here I have two classes, two objects, user and session storage, and two ways to actually uh, configure those object, the session name and the session class. Um, so using a container, so this is a small example using Pimple. Pimple is a small dependency injection container uh, written in PHP. It's about 100 lines of code. So it's not a big library. This is just one file actually. Uh, and it's enough to actually manage all the dependency that you have in your code. So that's not something that is used by um, Drupal. Uh, but that's yet another container that I wrote um, uh, several years ago. So here, I create a container. I create two uh, parameters. The first one is a session class. The second one, the session name. And then I define two um, objects. The first one is the uh, user class. So the definition is done uh, via an anonymous function. And the second one is the definition for the session storage. So above the line, this is about um, the creation of the container. So this is a description of my objects and how to configure them. And the second part, so below the line, is how you can use the container. So as you can, as you can see, if I want to get the user, I'm asking the user um, um, from the container. So from a user perspective, this is exactly the same as the very first slide. So instead of saying new user, I'm asking the container to give me a user. And I don't care about uh, the dependencies anymore. I don't care if the user object has a session storage as a dependency. I just ask, I'm just asking for the user, um, uh, the user um, object from the container. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just to be clear, so the f be before, um, above the line, it, it is just about configuring the dependency injection container. So describing the relationships between all the objects. So above the line, there is nothing created. So there is no user object, there is no session storage. And the very first time I'm asking for a user, then the container is actually creating the user object. It knows that to, create, to be able to create a user, it needs uh, a session storage. So it creates a, user, a session storage first, getting a session name, returning it, and then uh, the user object can be created. So I have abstracted how to create all the objects that I have in my application. So some rules about uh, containers. The first one, very important one, objects must not be aware of the container. So never ever inject the container into your objects. If you are doing that, you are using a container um, the wrong way. Uh, so each object, each, each class should be aware of their dependencies, but should not be aware uh, of the container. That's easy to understand. Uh, if you are injecting a container, it's much more complex to actually replace the implementation of one of the dependency uh, when you are doing testing, for instance. And then if you are injecting a container, you, don't, you do not really know which dependencies are going to be used within the object. Uh, and of course, you are coupling your domain objects to the container that you, can, that you are using. So you will not be able to replace the container with another implementation. So object must not be aware of the container. 
which means that a container is able to manage any PHP objects. You don't need anything special to support a container. Of course, your classes should use dependency injection, but that's all. Yeah, so never ever inject the container into your objects. There are some exceptions. Um, for instance, if you want to lazy load a dependency. So when I create a user object, I need a session storage, which means that to be able to create a user object, I need to create a session storage, even if I don't need it now. Which means that if you don't use the user uh, setter, for instance, if you don't set the language, you will have created uh, the session storage without using it. So that's a waste of resources. Uh, and sometimes, if we are talking about a connection to a database, if we are talking about an object that calls a web service um, at construction time of, or whatever, uh, it can be really heavy. In this case, is a good, um, the only way to actually um, do that is to inject the container. So you just inject the container, which is just about the description of the dependencies. And the very first time you need to actually use the session storage, you get it from the container. So this is how you can lazy load um, uh, object if you need to. Um, so I won't talk about that today, but um, if you are using the Symfony dependency injection container, uh, there is another way to actually lazy load uh, the dependency. So you don't need to inject the container to do that with, with Symfony, the recent versions of Symfony. Okay. So something else, a container does not manage all your objects, far from it. So a container manages global objects. So what we call uh, services. So an object that is sending emails is a good case. Um, so it, all the objects that um, you need only one instance of. So a database connection is a good example. Um, a user, when we are talking about uh, an HTTP request, you're, you're going to have only one user. A request, uh, for instance, a logger, for instance, is a good example. But uh, the container is not something that you want to use for your model object. So a product, a blog post, an article, they cannot be managed by uh, a container. So. Okay, um, so remember, most of the time, you don't need a container to use dependency injection. You can use dependency injection today without any container, but as soon as you need to manage a large number of objects, then it's nice to be able to wrap everything with a container. Okay, so that's all for dependency injection and what a container is. Now I'm going to talk about um, the implementation in Symfony and again, this is what uh, Drupal version 8 is going to use for um, managing all uh, the dependencies and all the objects, the global objects of Drupal 8. So I have some small examples here. So this is um, an example of how you can configure uh, the container. So the Symfony uh, dependency injection container can be configured via PHP or XML or YAML files. So here you have an example, this is a YAML file, and, and in Drupal, um, um, all the, the, the container description is done via uh, YAML files. So the first line here is the name of uh, the, 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 the object that you want to store into the container, and there is only one required um, attribute, which is the class name, so that when you want to get the JSON authorization object, uh, the container knows how to create. So it just instantiates the JSON class from this namespace. From this definition, um, the, the Symfony container is actually uh, working in two different ways. The first one is um, by actually creating everything on the fly which means that it reads the YAML file and then it introspects um, uh, all the arguments and it creates uh, the object on the fly. The second one is um, by building a PHP class um, and optimizing uh, how to create uh, the services. So that's how it's done in, in, in Drupal. 
so based on all the configuration that you've done for the container, uh, Symfony is actually going to dump a PHP class representing your configuration able to create uh, your object. So this is uh, how Symfony is going to dump uh, or to convert your configuration file to PHP. So there is a product in function uh, method which is going to be called if you call container get and the name serialization.json. And as you can see, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, there is no overhead, you know, using the container this way, there is no overhead. If you uh, would have created the, um, the dependency yourself, you've, you would have written the exact same code. So you return a new uh, instance of the JSON um, object. Oh, there is something I forgot to mention. So as a container is mostly managing global objects, objects that uh, you need only one instance of, by default, if you are not configuring uh, it in any other way, by default, you always get the same instance of the object. So every time I'm calling this method, I'm going to have the same instance of the JSON class, right? So that's why we are actually storing the instance into um, this uh, property. Of course, we can manage arguments, um, constructor arguments. So this is another example from uh, Drupal 8. Uh, here you can see that we take one argument and the at convention means that we want to inject um, the key value uh, dependency into uh, the state object. So somewhere in the configuration, there is another object with the key value name, and the key value name, uh, the key value object is configured there. So if you want to get the state object from the container, the first thing Symfony is going to do is to create the key value one to be able to inject it into uh, the state constructor. And as you can see, this is how it's done. So we create a new state instance, and then we get uh, the key value uh, object to be able to inject it. So again, this is exactly what you would have done uh, yourself if you um, want to create a state object. Okay, um, so this is yet another example. So here, um, the module handler constructor takes two arguments. The first one is a list of modules, and the second one is an instance of cache bootstrap. So the first one, um, is actually the convention to be able to um, um, make it a parameter, which means that container.modules is actually a value that is configured, that is set elsewhere in a Drupal code. So it's not this string that is going to be injected into um, the module handler constructor, but the value of this parameter on uh, the container. So you can make things uh, more complex so here uh, we have some class, we have some arguments, and the last two lines is how you can inject dependencies uh, with uh, setters uh, methods. So here uh, the URL generator is actually uh, taking a bunch of arguments, and then after the object is created, Symfony is going to call the set request method and the set context method with those um, um, other services. And this is how it's compiled by the Symfony um, container. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but as you can see, we create the object and then we inject um, some other dependency, the, re the request one and the request context one uh, via uh, methods. Actually, the slides are a bit old, so I think it's, it's I'm pretty sure it's, it's very different now, if you have a look at Drupal 8. Um, there is another way, so sometimes instead of calling the, the constructor, you can have some kind of factories. So a factory is uh, an object able to create other objects, right? Uh, so here to be able to create a database connection, we are not instantiating uh, the connection class directly. Instead, we are calling a static method, get connection on a database um, uh, class. Right? So this is how you can do that with a factory. Um, and yeah, this is how it's um, converted to plain PHP. 
And of course, um, so here you have a database slave. So this is the exact same definition as before. So using the same factory, but different arguments. So this connection class is probably going to return a different object based on the arguments. Um, you can create an object by a factory that is actually a service. So instead of a factory class here, I'm using a factory service. So again, this is an example in, uh, in Drupal. So uh, we have uh, a cache factory service, uh, which is defined elsewhere in uh, Drupal. And then we, call, we are calling the get method with the default argument. It's going to return a cache backend interface object. So that's the cache default object. Okay, we also have uh, what we call aliases. So aliases is a way to rename um, uh, a service to another name. So, um, so sometimes, like for uh, the database connections, you have several different connections with names, but there is a default one. And you want to name the default one connection, a short name. So you can use an alias. So here, for instance, when you get the config.storage object, it actually gets the config.storage.active service. So from a user perspective, you are only using the config storage, but behind the scene, we can easily switch from one storage strategy to another one. Okay. Um, yeah, so when using aliases like this, uh, you don't want our, your user to use the config.storage.active. You want your user to actually use the config.storage um, um, service directly. So the config.storage.active should be private, and that's possible. If I say public false, it means that the config.storage.active um, service is going to be created by the container, but you can't get it from the outside. So it's only available for injection into other uh, services. Um, and I, the last time I, I, I look at the, this, I think that the public false was not there. So that's something that should be fixed uh, in Drupal uh, if, if it's not already done. Um, it, it's, it's kind of important because when uh, you said public false, it means that we know that nobody is going to get it from the container uh, which means that Symfony is going to optimize the code even more uh, than you can do when public is true. So whenever you can set public false, it's a great way to optimize the dumped container, uh, the PHP one. Okay, we also have some abstract um, services. Um, this one is not a very good example. Uh, it's, it's a very bad one actually, uh, because as you can see, this, so an abstract um, an abstract uh, service is a service that you can use as a template for other services. So here, um, when I want to create a service that actually needs the service container as a, um, a dependency, which is really bad, uh, I can just inherit from this uh, container that uh, trait um, abstract service. So the way you can do that is by using parent. So here I have a logger factory and the parent is the container thread, which means that it's going to call set container and inject the, 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 the container um, into this object. So should also probably be fixed in, in, uh, in Drupal. Okay, if you have a look at Drupal, you can uh, get services from the container via those um, different possibilities. So you can call Drupal get container to get the container and then get any service. Um, or there is the service um, uh, method as well, or some shortcuts li like URL generator. Um, again, please refrain from using those shortcuts. It's much better, to, if possible, to actually inject the dependency instead of relying on those shortcuts. They are really practical because it means that whenever you are uh, in your code, you can just get some services from the container, but remember that it's always much better to be able to inject them instead of relying on the container. Okay, 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 okay. Um, so 
I've just talked about the basics about uh, the symphony dependency injection container today. Um, I won't talk about uh, more advanced topics because um, if you are using Drupal, you're not uh, going to use those um, on a regular basis. I think you will never ever uh, uh, create a compiler pass yourself, um, probably not. Uh, you will probably use tags. Tags is a way to uh, inject, hmm. okay. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult. Um, so what is a tag? Um, you can tag some services. So a tag is just a name. Um, for instance, we have a tag to say this is a kernel listener, for instance. Uh, or this is a twig extension. And when, um, so let's, let's, say, uh, let's say that we have uh, some twig extensions. So we have the twig environment. The twig environment is the main object um, responsible for actually um, rendering the templates. And you can add some extensions. Extensions to add some filters, some tags, whatever. But as a twig environment is an object managed by the container, how can I inject some external third party or custom extensions? So you need a way to be able to do that. And that's uh, what tags are for. So you create your service. The service is the extension that you want to register and you add the twig tag. And just by adding a twig tag, Symfony is going to be able to um, get a listing of all uh, the services tagged with the Twig tag and inject those extensions into the Twig environment. So that, that's how you can um, easily make the injection configurable from uh, the outside. And lazy services, I've talked about lazy services before. So it's available as of Symfony 2.4, which means that it's available in, in Drupal. And that's a great way to avoid injecting the, the, the container if you have some performance problems. Um, okay, so that's all for today. Um, if you have any questions about um, dependency injection, uh, the container that we have in Symfony, or Drupal 8 uh, usage of the container, um, feel free to ask. Yeah, so I think there is a microphone somewhere Uh, dynamic dependency injection a lot in Drupal because we are uh, using plugins. I'm here, right here. I guess okay, you can okay. see me. <laughs> um, so, for example, we have the Actions API in Drupal, and developers extend that for by implementing an Action plugin. And of course, the, the Action API doesn't know what the plugin has to receive as dependencies. So, what we are using in Drupal is having a static create method that receives the container. Mm -hmm. and then picks out whatever services it needs. For example, that action might want to send out an email, so pick out the, the email service from the container and then invoke yep. the constructor with all this argument it needs. I don't know where that pattern came from. Is that something you're doing in Symfony as well? Or <laughs> no so yeah, we, we have to do that in Drupal so because we don't know beforehand what dependencies will be needed because we are so dynamic. Yeah, um, so yeah, I, I don't know that part of the code that well, so it's a bit difficult to answer. Um, but tags and compiler passes are probably one way. I'm not sure it, it's going to work in your specific case. Um, but the main idea would be, yeah, yeah, because what you are injecting is actually not, uh, you are not injecting services, right? Because those objects um, have parameters, uh, they can have uh, you can have more than one instances of those objects. Is that correct? Yes. So yeah. the objects themselves are, are plugins. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I saw the code. Mm -hmm. And the first time I saw the code, I said, oh, yeah, that's ugly. It's not possible. And then I understood why uh, you're doing that. And honestly, I don't have any better solution. So it looks good enough. Yeah. I mean, good enough is enough. Oh yeah, yeah that, that, that's something very important. Um, design patterns and, and best practices are great, but you can break them. You can, you know, escape from them. 
that's that's time so you said container is to store uh, instances or objects yeah so what if i want to uh, you know keep an instance in multiple requests if you Drupal want to keep an instance in multiple requests uh, drupal use uh, serialization for that and there is a big problem with that so when you're talking about uh, several requests, you are talking about several HTTP requests or yeah. several requests within one HTTP request? Uh, several requests. So you store, you serialize objects from one request to the next one? Y yes. That's correct? Yes. And why? Uh, um, well, uh, in form submission, uh, Drupal have a form uh, component in which we store uh, the original request and the original input by the user to uh, next request. Okay, but that's that's kind of independent from uh, the container because the container is really about all the global objects, so objects that do not depend on um, what is submitted by the user. So it should not be it should not be um, depending on the request, for instance. So that's something that we fix in Symfony. Uh, that was fixed also in Drupal 8. Uh, the request uh, coming from uh, the user is actually not a service. Right? So that's why we have the request stack object now. Uh, so if, if you are serializing the um, object that represents what the user submitted, that's fine. I mean, that's a totally different concern. So it's not something that you can store in the container anyway. So. Any other questions? Okay, so just a small, one more thing. Um, if you are doing um, um, Drupal apps and you are probably developing uh, Drupal apps, um, uh, I'm, I, I've been working on a profiler um, for the last six months or so. And um, I've created a Drupal extension. So if, if you want to uh, give it a try, uh, and give me some feedback, um, it would be really helpful for me. So this is a profiler like uh, XFProf or Xdebug, um, slightly different with a different UI. Um, so if you want to give it a go, it's free. Uh, we are in private beta, so um, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much.